India. Uh, the captain speaks. This is where we will be trying to open the Pandora box and discuss on issues prevalent and relevant in the beautiful game and talk it out to those who have had the inside experience in this world. Uh, I am Rahul Pandey and I would like to welcome my co-moderator, Mr. Aparup Chakrabarti. Uh, so today we are going to talk on the control of the game. Yes, uh, today we will delve deep into the matter of refereeing and how do they take control of the game and not let it change into a fist fight or even worse, and help in maintaining its authenticity. Uh, so for today, we have been joined by Mr. Keith Hackett, uh, who is a former international football referee and has officiated in big uh, FIFA, UEFA, Premier League and FA Cup games. Uh, so yeah, a lot of experience in there and we're going to try and juice it out to make a beautiful conversation. We will be having uh, our three more special guests like uh, Mr. Supriya Bhattacharya, Mr. Pujosh Biswas and Mr. Subrata Das. They all are from the All India Football Federation. Mr. Supriya Bhattacharya has been working uh, with AIFF as referee instructor, come assessor in all the senior level tournaments including iLeague and I, ISL for the last uh, six years. Excellent. And, uh, and, and I would uh, introduce Mr. Piju Biswas. He's also a referee assessor of All India Football Federation. Uh, he has been working since 2010 in, in, in iLeague as referee assessor. Excellent. And last but not the least, Mr. Subrata Das. Uh, he's also a referee assessor and referee instructor since 1999. So we Excellent. have a, a panelist uh, with all of experience written away there. Excellent. So, so we're going to talk on a lot of matters uh, that have been going around uh, since the last few years. And Keith, welcome to the show. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank to you. Uh, let's Thank hope you. we're going to have a great discussion with all of your insights. So uh, I'm going to start with you, Keith. And uh, of course, you know, the first point that came into my mind when I just read this topic uh, was match control. What does that term mean to you? What do you make out of it? Well, I think that uh, the referee has a responsibility, first of all, to prepare well, to have great knowledge of the laws of the game, uh, to have an understanding of the changes that take place in the game with regard to tactical play, players, and I think they go out, they, they should go onto the field of play with the knowledge, but also with an understanding that they want to enjoy their refereeing and their refereeing career. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the first thing is that fitness is the foundation. Yeah. How, how quickly do they move? Uh, how close proximity they are to play? Um, and I talk about the need for Referees, there is a process in referee, and it's simple. First of all, you have to see the incident. You have to recognize uh, its impact in terms of the laws of the game, think about that, and then act. And that process, as you gain experience, speeds up. So at the very elite level of the game, you're doing that in milliseconds of a fraction. You're seeing a challenge, you're determining whether it's a foul or not. You're determining the level of the foul to determine if a sanction is required. Uh, and therefore, with all that basis, fitness plays a part. Because if you don't see an incident, then you're going to get some things wrong. And you're not going to advance in terms of your career. And, and I find, you know, I've, I've analysed thousands of games at all levels of the game. And the basis is that often it's, it's not the integrity of the referee that's in question. It's often that he hasn't seen an incident. It, you know, players can cover up. Uh, he can be out of position because of an explosive breakaway by a forward team. So I say to referees that are listening in that my expectation of a referee depending on the level at which they're officiating, they're going to average about 11,500 meters per game average. And uh, of that 1,000 meters 
is at seven meters per second. <laughs> now, that is in fact an explosive sprint because in my time as a referee and my colleagues sitting listening, we, we were about endurance athletes. We, we had to sustain 90 minutes and more. And most of our training was about endurance, how fit we were. The modern referee, in addition to having that endurance ability, also, also has to have dynamic, explosive sprinting in their makeup. The reason being that the skill sets of players have increased, have got better over the years. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it is a referee will not anticipate or read what the next move is of that particular player. And he can get caught out of position very quickly. And so an explosive sprint will help him recover. Well, here I see these as the basics of refereeing. One, to control a game. Often we say, how you control the game is entirely down to you as a referee, but you must control it. Then I'll move into the area of communication. Often referees are in good positions and they don't communicate well with the players and those that are watching the game. So they have to be very clear. We have to, as referee coaches, spend time with our referees, first of all, going back to basics. And I've done this with professional referees. So we, we, we take the basis of a whistle. And we actually listen to what the referee is whistling, how he whistles. Because what we've got to understand is that at the basics of refereeing, the whistle is our first line of communication. Mm. And so therefore, it's, are these short blasts? Is it a lengthy blast? So we're looking about the length of the whistle, how long it's blown. We're looking at the tone of the whistle in terms of how strong is it being blown. And what we need to do is understand that we have some variety in the whistle technique. So that's the first line. The second line is, of course, if we are assistant referees, mm. then our ability to uh, adopt a good sound flagging technique and movement up and, up and down the touchline is really important. And it is a different skill set. So we have to understand that signals, first of all, from a referee and from an assistant referee have to have clarity. And therefore, if... It, if you're saying it's an indirect free kick, it's an indirect free kick. The arm has to be vertical and it has to be held until it's played by another player to avoid confusion. And we'll, we'll get into the detail of uh, a step process that I talk about in terms of referees have to communicate with a voice. You know, they have to use the voice sensibly. Sometimes it's, it's a word of encouragement. It's a quiet word. It might be that you run alongside a player and you say to him, look, I want an improvement in your behavior. This is a quiet word. It's, it's between you and the player. It's not public, but it is a warning. And that is the first step. The second step is the public warning where you bring the player to you uh, not directly towards you. Don't signal to the player, point to him and then say, I want you coming this way. What you need to do is adopt a triangle system. So if the player is at A and I'm at B on the triangle, it is much better to say to the player, come and join me at point C. You don't have to worry about it's triangular in its, in its uh, view and its debate to get the message over but you're in, inviting the player to join you. And at this stage, you're gonna say, look, I am now looking for an improvement. And, it, and you may have a system where 
you might want to bring the captain over to make it very public. And then at, at that next point, then he's, he's, he's going to receive a sanction. All that is good, but of course, part of the laws of the game is that we're going to have to issue a yellow and red card. And yeah. here I find that there are some referees who raise the yellow card to the back of a player. This is not good technique. So in the initial stages, the referee should inquire the player, bring the player towards him in the triangular system I've adopted and say and ask him his name and then show the yellow card. Make certain he sees the yellow card. Make certain, right, that you're retaining or keeping some distance between the player and yourself. So if you're a grassroots referee, my recommendation is if you're going to talk to a player, he is at least one meter away, or I would say two arms length. And the reason I say this at grassroots level more than the professional level is sometimes the players can su surprise you by aiming a strike at you, by, by trying to thump you. Now this is in the rare scenario. So if you adopt a, a, a process of being a meter away, that helps. Yeah. So those yeah. are some of the small points in terms of communication. And you can see I can go into a lot of detail on that. Mm -hmm. Everyone is looking for consistency and consistency starts at minute one. And that is the application of the law. Now, one of the things that I find often, let me give you an example here, is that you're getting time wasting and time consuming from minute one in the game. Often this goes unnoticed. An experienced referee knows that this takes place because you might be the top of the league team and you're playing a mid-table team. What the mid-table team is going to do tactically is consume time, which is within the law. But at the same time, they're going to, they're going to waste time. And tactically, they'll start doing that from the first minute. Often I see referees coming in with five minutes to go in, uh, in the second half, trying to then impact on managing time and time wasting. Yeah. And therefore, it's a case of, this is just an example of being consistent. And as a group of referees, uh, we have to understand the laws. Um, and I'll talk about that in more detail. Then we have the confidence. Referees have to be confident. And here, sometimes the impact of a, a, a fellow referee or an assessor mm. can impact dramatically on the confidence of a referee. Referees know when they've had a poor, indifferent game or a difficult game. They know this. So my advice to assessors is when you go into the, into the dressing room to review the, the performance, you've made all the notes. Your aim, first of all, should be to uh, show the good things in that referee's performance. Be prepared to praise. Even though the game's gone poorly for the referee, you've got to find some positives. Maybe that's in the fitness. Maybe it's in his signals. Maybe it's in his communication. And now let's say that we have viewed this match and he's had a difficult penalty kick decision that you disagree with as an assessor or in a, a referee observer. The best approach is not to go and say, you made a mistake here, you got it wrong. What you need to do is to ask that referee to talk you through that situation. Talk me through. Tell me, how did you see and how did you come to make this penalty kick award? Or it might be to the assistant referee, how did you come to flag offside? Talk me through. And at that point, if you then, as, is, as the outline is being given, 
you then have to say, look, from my position, I have to say that this didn't look to be an accurate decision. And the reason being is, for example, I thought the player was going down before any contact was made. I thought it was an act of simulation. Um, I thought you were out of position and your decision was incredible. And as a result, you missed a holding offence or the first offence by the attacker on the defender. Again, some small examples. Courage. I think that if you're in front of 100,000 spectators, and I've been in this position personally, and you've got to make a penalty kick award, referees at any level have to have courage. They, they have to be, if you like, their own man or own woman in terms of referee. They have to have the courage to make the big calls, not to shirk them. If you believe that's a penalty kick, it's a penalty kick. You have to give it. And then I, 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 of these six C's, common sense. Um, I, I sort of headline this because I say to referees when I'm coaching them, no surprises. Sometimes referees will believe that they've seen something and they'll make a decision without understanding the, the, the whole information. And, you know, some of, even some of our top referees in England at times guess at a decision and guess wrong. If you haven't seen it, don't make the decision. Uh, I would uh, want to ask you of your own experience in one particular game. And uh, you might as well know which game I'm kind of talking about right now. This was, uh, of course, uh, the famous 1990 Manchester United versus Arsenal a game at the Old Trafford, a 21-man brawl, uh, as it yes. is called by many. And, uh, you know, uh, there, there was so much going on the field. There was just one player who wasn't involved in this. How was your initial reaction to this? And, you know, it went uh, with the Football Association hearing later on, uh, where upon a three-hour consultation with you and the other match officials, discussions, uh, the decision was taken that Arsenal and Manchester United will the points need to be deducted from both the teams. So, you know, what went through your head when all of them, that was going on field, when you see 21 players kind of fighting each other? Well, I think it's a really good point uh, because you have to be prepared for everything and anything as a referee. Hmm. So one of the key aspects of refereeing is awareness. So you have to be aware. If I can liken it to a, a, a kettle on, a, on the heat, uh, you know, if it, if it gets too hot, it boils. And if the bubbles are forming, then yeah. you're really going to get scalded. This is a, the temperature of the game that we talk about in referee. And because I was confident, very experienced referee, I, in that game, when I review it, I believe that I played, first of all, too many advantages. And in playing too many advantages, because a big crowd, very exciting game, play on, advantage, advantage, all of a sudden, the players say, I can do anything. I can get away with anything with this referee. So that's the first line. Then the second line is, if, if you look at the, the, the actual film clip, you will see that it was a 21-man brawl that I brought back under control within, within seconds. Mm. Now, from that, I then, uh, if you like, walked away from that game very unhappy. I was asked a question by the FA. If I had seen everything that was going off in this particular incident, what would I have done? And I said to them, well, here's the dilemma. Because I have 21 players who effectively could be given a red card. Yeah. Do, I give, do I give 21 red cards? <laughs> so... 
What I didn't see was and wasn't aware of that there were two yeah. players in a previous game had history yeah. of conflict. Yeah. There were players, both of I at Winterburn of Arsenal, McClare of Manchester United, who yeah. I'd refereed yeah. on many occasions and had not ever been a problem. Yeah. But they carried on to that field a problem of conflict. And they waited and waited and waited until there was an opportunity and it exploded. Yeah. So what did I learn from that? I went with the FA and sat with the FA and wrote out a criteria for any further mass confrontations. And that is, that is still in operation today. Let me just run through it because I think it's important. Sure, sure. If a referee in the modern game is now, and he has two assistant referees, and there is conflict, a mass confrontation in the field of play, the first thing that the referee's got to do is blow his whistle and shout very hard as he moves towards the point of conflict. Okay. That's the first thing. Hmm. The assistant referee on the touchline closest to the incident, moves quickly onto the field as a support mechanism for the referee. The one that's near the technical area moves a little slowly to the scene, keeping his eye and looking out for any runners, distance runners, players who travel some distance into the conflict. And having done that, they're now all three around the mass confrontation. And my expectation is this, and this is for Premier League referees and referees in England. First of all, we know that the outcome will be a minimum of two yellow cards, but that's incidental. That's in the criteria. So the referee, his first uh, duty is to issue any red cards and so the first red card if it's for an awaiting player will go to the awaiting player first and that player will then be asked to leave the field of play and the referee will monitor that the referee that player is leaving the field of play mm. the second player that to be cautioned may be an awaiting player right he will be caught, he will be, sorry, red carded, and he will then go, and I will ensure before he's sent off, there's a lot of distance between the two players, because they could be the two players that have caused the problem. The next process is, I then, as the referee, ask my two colleagues, did they see any red cards in addition to what I've seen? Were there any off-the-ball incidents that I'd missed? And if there were, then a further red card would be issued. And now, having done that, I would then issue any yellow cards cautions. And I'll be truthful here. I will be looking for both captains. Okay. Because the captains have a responsibility, in my eyes, to control the players of their team. So a minimum, if they've not got red cards, the two captains will be cautioned. And then the game is restarted. The important thing is to take your time as a referee, to allow the temperature to come down, to remain calm, to communicate clearly before you restart the game. So that's an example of how you have to learn to experience to improve yeah. refereeing going forward. Don't referee to get fit, get fit to referee. And what you're seeing in front of you is a map of a football field, an, an actual game. And um, so this is the, the patrol path of a modern referee in, in the game. Now, if you're, an, if you're at grassroots level, then it's probably wider and deeper. But you will see that if I look, explain the colours, you will see yellow, orange and red. The red is where the referee is running at a speed of seven metres per second. 
And you will see that he takes his flow path is from penalty area at this bottom corner to the top right hand corner. And, and my expectation is that a modern referee at the elite level will be able to run from penalty area to penalty area, maybe in a straight line, in 11 seconds. And the reason I'm, I'm quoting these figures is, is when you're coaching referees, if they have an understanding of what your expectation is and your specific, then they can train to that requirement. <coughs> Next slide, please. So here I give you, uh, and you've now got in your, uh, if you like, information. You've got what I consider to be endurance, what I consider to be sprinting, and we could get into the physical and mental side considerably. <clears throat> and I hope in the future when I probably invited by, I would very much like to talk about the psychology of refereeing <clears throat> and how body language and interpersonal skills become important in, in refereeing and are important. Yeah. We need to just consider the basic principles of decision making. Uh, I communicate well uh, to be able to handle and deal with conflict. I much prefer referees to be proactive, to prevent rather than reactive. Um, and that's, that's, you know, this is, a, let me give you an example. You've got a simple thing like a throwing. Is it far better to inform a player where you want the throwing to be taken from rather than allow him to go eight yards away from where it should be thrown and then penalizing him? So communicate from being taken. podcast will understand that we're always learning we never stop learning we learn from each other my colleagues who work with the Indian FA they will pass on experiences to me and I will learn so we're always and we always need to share information and share experiences but you have to have a good knowledge of the laws of the game and a, a knowledge of how to implement them. And be a good manager of people and events. And, and I, I, I talk about, with referees, not about a game of football, but I talk about an event. And the reason it's an event is that the referee's performance is not just 90 minutes of the game. It's before the game has started. Is the field marked out correctly? You know, even at professional level and international level, let me tell you, in the 1970 World Cup final, the referee Jack Taylor of England was about to blow his whistle to start that game and recognise that there were no corner flags at a World Cup final. And so the game was stopped and delayed until corner flags, part of a mandatory part of the laws of the game, were applied. So he started before he'd even blown his whistle. And we as referees start in ensuring that our paperwork, our administration, our preparation, our warm-up processes prior to a game, the way we're dressed, are all part of an event. Is the, is, the, is the field marked out properly? Is it fit to play? What are the weather conditions? You know, and, and all those scenarios that go off. Have we got one ball or have we got several? You know, because if we're, in, if we're refereeing at grassroots level, maybe the team can only afford one football. And if we're aware of that, then during the course of the game, when the ball goes over the touchline, we know that that is the ball that's got to come back and be played. You can't simply point to a technical area, because there isn't one, and say, I want the ball coming on. So we have to adapt to the environment and the games that we're refereeing. The principles of decision-making are to see, to recognise, to think and act. Next slide. 
in comparison uh, i league and isl a lot of spectators are coming to watch the match and in the i, I league as you mentioned that uh, matches like mohan bagan is going all uh, lot of spectators are coming but in isl most of the matches uh, remain uh, full packed stadium yes yes Yeah, yeah, full of spectators in the stadium. How? Yes, can... I think that's a really good question. Um, one of the important things is, um, first of all, to prepare. So, if if you're a, a, a new referee onto the panel of the ISL, the best thing you can do is get that get, get that individual be the fourth official in that stadium before he referees in the stadium. This is the first thing because it gives him the experience and the feel of the geography of the stadium and the, and the playing field as well, and so this is the first thing. But um, it's it is very much a referee has to use the the spectators as a form of uh, if you like. Uh, raising of the adrenaline that will enhance the performance of the referee in front of a big crowd, invariably. But it's a step process. So the first thing is one of the reasons I introduced a pre-match warm-up is that uh, it was important that um, the referees had the feel of the stadium. Before kickoff, and in warming up in the stadium, uh, that that was a good, if you like, help to towards enduring the fans. But for me, uh, you know, I've refereed in front of 120,000 spectators in Azteca in Mexico. It's a, it was a memorable game, um, but we have to concentrate on the game and forget the fans. They don't influence us. Uh, they can't influence us, uh, and often they will be shouting differently than what you are doing. We're not there to please the fans. We're there to actually officiate a football match. But I do understand that it adds additional pressure, and therefore there has to be a greater awareness of the responsibility that you have as a referee at the very highest level. Yeah. Your performance. Yeah. Has to be like an actor on the stage. Every day he goes out into the theatre, he has to give the very best performance. And this is the referee. The referee and his colleagues are in a theatre of passion, and he has to remain focused and aware, attentive, and have an understanding and gain experience in that situation. I had a. The opposite of that. I had a referee, a very experienced referee, who I called, who I said was a 75-minute referee. For 75 minutes, he was uh, good in his performance, consistent. But then in the final 15, he, his performance levels dropped. And when we started to examine, I first of all thought it might be fitness that was the problem. But in fact. He was internally, when the sports psychologist was involved, he was saying to himself as a referee, "This game is in control. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. 75 minutes, everything is okay. I'm refereeing well." And what he then would do is drop his levels of concentration. So the sports psychologist made him put a rubber band on, around his wrist, and his referee colleagues, assistants, would communicate and say. Time to flick the rubber band on his wrist and just get a snap, a bit, a little bit of pain that said, "Whoop, I've got another 15 minutes to go." So, referees should uh, really enjoy being involved, and they're very lucky, aren't we? We're very lucky as referees to have been involved in the passion of two teams playing football in front of a large crowd. There's nothing better, really. And we should be better referees for that experience. So, Keith, basically, you were talking about a wake-up call for the referee, right? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, you know, 
the, the one thing that, that referees can fall into is a trap of experience can actually think, oh, the game's easy. You know, I've instead last week I had teams that were at the top of the league and this week there's are two teams at the bottom of the league. Let me tell you that invariably those games at the bottom of the league are more difficult to referee. But the outcome is that if we fall into a sense of the game is going well, everything is fine, I've made some good decisions, the game will kick you in the rear. It has a habit of kicking you in the rear. So you avoid that. Because we're refereeing a game when we enter the stadium. That's when we start to referee a football match. We prepare well. And we haven't completed that until we get home. Uh, I want to know uh, how a uh, referee uh, managed a player, especially his aggressive behavior. How player uh, referee manages his team? Often, when there is aggressive behavior, yeah. there's going to be a sanction. But let's assume that we know that player and we see a build-up in that player. This is the time to run alongside him and say, look, you have a, as a player, you have a responsibility to the game here, to play within the spirit of the laws of the game. And that is my expectation of you. People have paid money, if this is in the ISL, people have paid money to watch you play and they would want you to be on the field of play for 90 minutes. But now I want an improvement from you. So I think there are times when you do that out of the public eye. You know who the aggressive players are. Smile sometimes. You have to just go, whoa. One of the great things in, in uh, the signals of a referee is the, the palm of the hands facing downwards. When you're talking to a referee, you're actually saying, calm down. I am not in conflict with you, the player. I am the referee of this match. I'm not in conflict with you. My expectations are that I want 22 players on the field of play. Please behave. Because, you know, you have, the, you have in body language terms the ability yeah. to be able to get that message across. But you cannot ignore it. And the aggressive player is the one that the bubbles come in the kettle quicker. And so you've got to turn the temperature down. And the only person that's going to turn that temperature down is you. Or alternatively, let me open up another opportunity. And that is that you run side alongside his captain. And you say to his captain, your number four yeah. is coming into my vision too often. He's having too much to say. And I don't like his approach to the game. Now, captain... Your responsibility to tell him, because if I have to speak to him, to having a quiet word with you, I will sanction him. So these are two ways in which you can get your message across effectively. Now, my question is, sometimes uh, in domestic league it happens, winning team goalkeeper, during his injury takes more time than necessary as he uh, uh, what is your advice or your experience if you share here we can share it with our heart uh, yes junior level i think i think you're asking me about the uh, effective time wasting that a goalkeeper takes yes. yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, this is a worldwide problem. This is not just, this is not just India. This, is, this happens a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I touched on the subject. That this is about referees' awareness, first of all. The referee has to be aware that time wasting is one aspect that we can deal with. Time consuming is much more difficult. And, play, and, and this is like the law has not helped referees because it now allows the goalkeeper, if the ball goes out on one side of the goalpost, he can take the goal kick from the other side. And, and this gives him the opportunity of going and fetching the ball, 
walking around behind the net and then coming onto the field and all that goes. The important thing is to get in first as a referee. Go in first. And um, when there's a corner kick, so there is a corner kick, just all play up slightly. Just go up. And go to the goalkeeper and you have an opportunity to say, look, uh, I know that we've only been playing for 15 minutes, but you're taking an awful long time with goal kicks, with free kicks, with with the ball. Uh, you're, you're clearly adopting delaying tactics. I want you to be aware that I will enforce the law in terms of six seconds, and I'll be more firm with it than normal because you are bringing this time-delaying tactic time-wasting tactic to my attention. So here is a proactive approach again to get in first. Yeah. As a referee, I don't want any referee to stand on the halfway line, point at his watch, and wave to the goalkeeper, come on, come on, come on, come on. I don't want that. It can be done less publicly because what happens is you do this and you say, come on, come on, come on, come on. And the, goal, and the goalkeeper now, the focus of the attention on the goalkeeper is with all the spectators. And their expectation is that you're going to now do something about it. So the quiet word to the goalkeeper. The other quiet word is with the captain. I, you'll notice that at the toss-up of the coin to, re, to, to gain who's going to take the kick-off, I will say to the captains, look, captains, I will use you when appropriate. You are part of the game, and I will, I will have a quiet word. If I think a player is stepping out of line, I'll have a quiet word. So that both hear it. And then, so this is where you use the captain. You say to the captain, it's gone too far. It's gone too far now. I've, I've issued a private word with your goalkeeper. I'm now informing you that if you, your team do not improve in terms of time delaying, time wasting tactics, then I will have to come in and apply the law effectively. So you see how proactive refereeing runs through the theme and becomes more and more important at the top level of the game. But it also means that at grassroots level, you are beginning to develop awareness, skill sets that develop you as a referee and prepare you better for those things when they come because they become natural. So, quiet word, with the goalkeeper, no public, and then when he, when he does it, you penalise. Look, in, uh, in two major games, in a World Cup game, New Zealand v Australia in 1982, the laws of the game had been cha changed that the goalkeeper could only take four steps. Prior to the kickoff, I asked to see both goalkeepers in my dressing room with officials, and I said to them, look, gentlemen, the laws changed. I know that the Southern Hemisphere are not applying this law yet, but I have been instructed by FIFA that I will apply the, the new law. Therefore, I want you to be aware that you're only allowed four steps. So there was a little bit of leeway, but then I got the word to McCaptain and the goalkeeper was punished for taking more than four steps. And the goal resulted. Uh, no, a goal uh, could have resulted, but he, they took it too quickly from the wrong place. In the opening game of the European Championships in 88, Germany v Italy, Walter Zenger, the Italian goalkeeper in the most important game, also was guilty of doing more than four steps, having been warned during the game and having been, his manager being informed at half time that he was, the goalkeeper was behaving beyond the law and he would be punished and he was punished in the second half. So it's the application of law, but it's also the communication. Yeah, it's called selling your decisions, isn't it? Discussion with you, and I'm sure that it will be pretty, pretty insightful to our uh, uh, esteemed panelists from India as well. 
and uh, I think all the parties here will get benefited from this discussion. So uh, I guess it's time to wrap up. Aparup, what, what do you say about this? Yeah, for, unfortunately, we are running short of time. And thanks, thanks a lot to each of the panelists and Rahul, thanks Pleasure. to you as well. Mr. Keith, it was a very, very detailed discussion, actually. Very technical, and thanks a lot for sharing your experience. Thanks. And uh, thanks to all our listeners. I hope this uh, does get some sort of an insight to you as well. And uh, well, that is it from us in uh, our series, which is going to bring in a lot more discussion from the field of football. That's it from us today. And uh, yeah, stay safe. And for everything about sports, stay tuned to Sports Flashes.